I think I just started recording. Uh, so uh, today the goal is to talk about John Brown, the real story, to answer the questions that uh, you went over on Friday on your worksheet. I know that's not the best thing when a teacher's gone for a block for you just to get a big long worksheet, but it actually works well because we were going to do that whether I was here or not. Uh, so we'll go over that, and, and, and our goal, our number one objective is to try to understand perspective and different points of view about things. So uh, and, and violence in Congress, it, it's actually a really interesting story. So I have lots of homework that I've done on my part to prepare for discussion about today. Um, uh, probably some of you maybe can even fill in some of the blanks and information that might be missing for me, or maybe even you have different information. So I know that a lot of you... Uh, on your worksheet, for instance, maybe struggled with what was John Brown's uh, nickname or his code name at Harper's Ferry Ray. About half of you got that right and about half of you missed it. And a lot of people were like, I don't even know how to Google it, Mr. Bellamy. I looked for 15 minutes and I couldn't find it. Well, let me show you something just really fast because this is for fun. Uh, I don't need this window, so I'm just going to do this. John Brown name Harper's Ferry. And it should come up. Ba bam Here. Sorry. Sorry, we're frozen. All I did was type in John Brown's name, Harper's Ferry, and ba bam It's right there. What? What? I know. Wait, what? I literally So all that. it took in the search was John Brown's name, Harper's Ferry. It is Isaac Smith. Pretty simple, right? Some of you were like Osawatomi Brown and a lot of different names, but uh, half of you came up with Isaac Smith. So it's kind of interesting to me to see how different we are uh, when we do our searches. So I'm going to go back in here and uh, let's see. We'll go to this class. Are you, you guys are purple, right? Um, who got a 26 out of 26? JD, did you? On this worksheet. Maybe you haven't looked yet. Oh, somebody just turned it in. Here, I'll look, uh, and I'll ask. Um, Peyton, you got a 26. Can I use yours as an example? Okay. I know. It was like, how did Peyton get a 26 out of 26? Well, then you got lucky, and I missed not grading that part. Maybe I should have picked someone smarter than Peyton. To use as my name. Okay, so here's the worksheet. Uh, first of all, some of you, it, you got a, a thing that popped up on your screen that said one of the questions has not been answered, and you had to hit submit anyway because you knew you answered everything. I don't know why it did that for some of you and not all of you, but part of it's because this shows up as a question on the test, but it's worth zero points. So when I put the image in, for some reason it counted that as a question. It shouldn't have, it didn't affect your grade, so don't worry about that. So, uh, but that's the picture. And you had the image that you could have pulled up from the chapter 15 notes also that was a little bigger and a little clearer to look at. So, uh, each of these questions, <clears throat> the bullet points, what makes John Brown's approach to abolition unique and describe John Brown's life prior to becoming an abolitionist was worth two points. If you did one of the questions but not the other, you got a two out of four. If you did both of them, you got a four out of four. Um, What's unique about Brown's approach to abolition? Yeah, it's a violent thing. Frederick Douglass, no violence, right? Frederick Douglass, abolition, he's in the ear of politicians. He's talking to eventually President Lincoln about, hey, we should get rid of slavery. It's horrible. Uh, uh, Harry Tubman, was she violent? No. Nope, she's sneaking people out of the South. This guy, well, first of all, he's not a black man or, or an escaped slave or a freed man. He's a white dude that thinks slavery is horrible and evil and awful and wrong. Why do you think those two questions are paired together, his approach to abolition and his life prior to? His family, they had a house that was open to slaves that needed a home. So they were helpful on the Underground Railroad. His background led him to be the man that he was. Was his father a violent abolitionist? No. Nope. But because he was taught the way he was taught as a young person, he became the adult that he was, with some modifications. Right? Dad wasn't the same as this John Brown. But uh, 
the, the things we learn when we're little help create the people that we are when we're big. That doesn't mean if you're a horrible person now that you're going to be a horrible person later. It doesn't mean if you're a great person now that you will be necessarily a great person later, but it probably helps. We're developing or you're developing as 13 and 14 year olds pretty solid opinions about what you're going to think for the rest of your life. And then you're going to go to high school and some of that's going to change one way or the other. And then you go to college and it changes some more. Then you get married and it changes some more. You have children and all of a sudden your perspective on a lot of things change. Because no longer are you the most important thing, your children are the most important thing. So John Brown's uh, approach to abolition and his upbringing are connected. Now, how many of you wrote in your answer about his background something about uh, he witnessed a black boy being uh, beaten severely? And it stuck with him. It gave him nightmares. He hated it. So you know, that's part of why he was what he was, because his memories from his childhood helped him understand how horrible slavery was. This thing's making awful noises. Still doesn't work. So, the second set of questions. Uh, what is he holding in his hands? He's got in one hand a rifle or a shotgun. So he's got a gun. And in the other hand... Okay, some people put uh, a map. Some people put a book. And uh, half, maybe a little bit more, put a Bible. How do you know it's a Bible? He's very religious, so you can make an assumption that it's probably a Bible. Who told him to do this violent abolitionist stuff? God. So those of you that put Bible might have made an assumption. There's also a clue in the image that it is a Bible that you may or may not have caught. There's a symbol on it. It's actually a, a, a letter from the Greek alphabet called the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's what that stands for. So, so there's a lot of symbolism that comes up. Uh, with that image. So he's got a, a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other. Do those two things seem to go together very often? Usually when we think of church and the Bible, we think of peacefulness and not violence. And usually when we think of guns, we think of, well, we think of violence or uh, hunting or just shooting for fun. But with the fierceness on John Brown's face, we're probably thinking he's not going on a deer hunt. By the way, I've got a herd of deer that are living in the woods below my, down down below my house, there's a ravine, and uh, they come up every night and they drink all the water out of our chicken water, if they're thirsty, and it's frozen like this, on those really cold days, they, they have no access to water, so they scrounge around and eat up chicken food and, and uh, drink all the water, and then they eat all the little tiny soft branches off all of my trees, which yeah. kind of stinks, but they're deer, and that's what deer do, so I don't get upset about it. Until the spring when all my trees are dead, and then I'll fight this out. But uh, the one of them had a baby. This must have been yesterday or the day before, because my wife got a picture of it down in the woods, and it's it looked like a you know just legs and wobbling yeah, still. So yeah, a brand new baby. But anyway, that's kind of cool. So a gun and a Bible, which is kind of contradictory. Um, what seems to be happening in, in the scene behind John Brown? Seems to be a war going on. What evidence says that there's a war going on? They're holding out guns against each other. Yeah, they're pointing guns at each other. Two what else? Flags. Two different flags. The flag on uh, your left is American flag. And the flag, I know this picture's uh, kind of sketchy because what's this flag here? It's not the British flag. The South's flag once the Civil War starts. Now, John Brown is actually dead before the Civil War starts. So he's not part of it. And a few people were a little bit off in, in putting that. But it's coming. What's the symbolism of the fire in the background? Burning people. Fire is symbolic of destruction. When we think of war, we think of violence and destruction and death and burning. How about the tornado on the other side? Destruction, or it could be place. And that might be the reason why we see the, the Conestoga wagons going through and the pioneers, which direction are they headed? West. This picture has less to do with the Harper's Ferry Raid, which happens in Virginia, 
and more to do with bleeding Kansas. So it's giving us place. The tornado, the uh, prairie fires, the, the Conestoga wagons, they're all giving us uh, clues as to where this event is taking place. Um, anybody figure out who this guy is? Right? I should circle it on my screen with my pointer. It's kind of hard to see on here, but the guy standing right in front of the flag. Again, this is a pretty rough looking picture. The one in the notes is a little better. So which side is he on? Northern side, the United States. But what color is he? He's black. Well, he looks kind of blue in the picture, but he's a black man. That is Frederick Douglass. Standing, and he's holding a book because he's intelligent and intellectual. Um, what is John Brown standing on right here? One of the questions. A white man's head, which means he's dead not only is he a white man but what does the color of the man's uniform tell us is it maybe you don't know it's okay to not know this answer it wasn't a question on the worksheet because this is stuff that's coming we got a guy here wearing blue and he's dead and he's on the side of the american flag and we got a guy here wearing a gray uniform and he's dead He's on the side of the Confederacy. So what's the symbolism of him standing on the head of the guy with the gray uniform? Who's okay with slavery? The guy on the ground. The guy on the ground. And so why is John Brown standing on his head? He hates slavery. He's against it. So he's standing on a Confederate soldier's head. What's the deal with the artist that, that, that created this picture making John Brown appear to be gigantic? Because it's his cause, it's his crusade. Is he gigantic? No. I'll give you some statistics in a little bit, but the simple answer is um, no. Larger than average? Yes. Gigantic? No. This image would lead us to believe that he's at least three feet taller than the man standing next to him. An average sized man at the time of this outbreak of the Civil War, this seems kind of weird to us, but we're getting taller as humans. The average size adult male at the outbreak of the Civil War is five feet six inches tall. So that would mean if this guy is average height, that John Brown must be eight or nine feet tall. You believe that's true? No, that doesn't make any sense. So, um, Lots of stuff going on in this picture, and, and this image really requires a lot of analysis. You have to think about uh, what's going on in the picture. And Peyton must have done at least some of that because, yeah, you did miss the question about Isaac Smith. I should go back and take points off, but I would never do that to you, Peyton. So it, it's a lot of people put Osawatomi, Osawatomi Brown. Uh, um, nope. Um, so uh, to retell the story of the raid. I'm going to get into that in just a little bit. Um, so I'm not going to take time while we're going over this worksheet to do that. Uh, but what was the outcome for Brown? He's captured and executed. Now, your opinion. Simple definition of a terrorist. It uh, looks like Peyton has up here. A person who uses unlawful violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, in pursuit of political aims. What is a civilian? A regular person. So anybody that's not a soldier. Are you and I civilians? Yeah. Yes. If an army attacked us, would that be uh, okay or cowardly? cowardly? Don't attack civilians, especially in a school. Yeah. We should be the safest place on the planet because even bad guys should not want to attack a building full of school children. And really, really, really nice guy social studies teachers. Oh, yes. yes, Noemi, I'm a nice guy. Stop saying mean things about me all the time. So, a, a martyr, a person who is killed because of their religious beliefs. Does it have to be a religious belief, by the way? No. Disbeliefs in general? Okay, uh, can anybody give me an example of someone historically that we would as a martyr, there's lots of examples. 
Joseph Smith is a, it could be considered a martyr. Very good. Because why did Joseph Smith die ultimately? Yeah, they didn't like his teachings because he was dedicated 100% to the teachings of his church. Jesus. So he was killed for it. Uh, Jesus is like the ultimate example of a martyr. For those of you that are at all churchy, right? Why did Jesus die? Because he was persecuted. Because he was persecuted. He gave up his life for all of us. Mm -hmm. If you don't go to church and you don't know that story, it's okay. But the story will tell us that he is the ultimate martyr. He gave his life for a cause that was bigger than himself. Got another one? Jews. <laughs> Explain. No. Just because you're killed for being who you are, does that make you a martyr? It's not a bad answer. I mean, they did die for their religious beliefs, but typically it's died for more of a cause. And they never knew that if they were actually like Jewish, they just took them one people that they were. And that's partly true, too. I think, wasn't it like brown hair people with brown eyes? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well... Uh, we're kind of getting for the question for those of you if you can hear me and all in the video recording, which I hope you can, so I don't have to do it later. Uh, was it brown hair people with brown eyes? Uh, not necessarily. In, in Hitler's world in World War II, the ideal human was blonde haired and blue eyed. But you didn't have to be blonde haired and blue eyed to survive in Nazi Europe. Uh, Hitler himself didn't meet those criteria, but that's what he viewed as the perfect race. So if you were blonde haired and blue eyed, you weren't necessarily safe. There were Jews that were killed in concentration camps that had those qualities, but uh, yeah, dark hair and dark eyes usually were a bad sign. But not necessarily martyrs for a cause. But who do, what do you think? Yeah, can, can we all agree that Martin Luther King Jr. was a, a martyr? Why was he assassinated? Because he had a really big mouth that he wasn't afraid to use it. Right? When I say really big mouth, that, that doesn't mean a, a bad thing. But Martin Luther King was killed because he said what he thought and he thought what he said. And he wasn't afraid to voice his opinion. If Martin Luther King would have just been an average, ordinary pastor or minister, would he have been assassinated? Probably not. But he was willing to act out against the difficulties that he was facing. So lots of those. Uh, so the question, is John Brown a, a martyr or a terrorist? Peyton here says he's a terrorist because he killed a bunch of people not saying what he did was a bad thing, but he could have done it peacefully. Well, you can't really kill people peacefully. But, but he could have maybe done what he wanted to do using politics. But it wasn't his style. So we got one person in the class that says he's a terrorist. How many of you, if you remember what you wrote, agreed that John Brown was a terrorist? You can't just be killing people because you disagree with them. If that were the case, we'd probably be killing each other. Because we have different opinions about things. Not necessarily uh, slavery or civil rights or, uh, or, or things like that, but we have different opinions, different perspectives on things. Now, some of you said he's a martyr. Explain to me how John Brown is a martyr. Someone who put that in. Bethany, you want to raise your hand. Come on, Bethany. Come on. Somebody in here, I'm sure when I graded this, I'm sure I didn't have 25 people put that he was a terrorist. I'm sure some of you put both. So if you put both, tell me why you were able to put both. Jackson? So you said both. Jackson said he, he was doing the right thing, but he maybe he did it the wrong way. Right? So both. So I guess if we, we just uh, labeled Joseph Smith as a martyr for dying for a cause, what if Smith, Joseph Smith, was going around killing people to convince them to become Mormons? So, it's all a matter of perspective. So it's not wrong if you say martyr. It's not wrong if you say terrorist. You're not wrong if you say both. It's really undefinable whether John Brown fit into those categories. If you were a, a slave-owning southern plantation owner, what is John Brown? This is undeniable. This is 100% accurate. If you're a slave-owning southern plantation owner, John Brown is a terrorist. terrorist. 
if you're Harriet Beecher Stowe and you wrote the book Uncle Tom's Cabin and you're an ardent abolitionist and you hate the idea of slavery, then John Brown is a martyr. He dies for a cause. Now, I want you to think about that just for a minute. Those people that we list as martyrs in history, Jesus, Martin Luther King, Joseph Smith, and probably a whole bunch of others, can you imagine being so passionate about something that you're willing to sacrifice your life for it? There's a lot of things that each of us care a lot about, but I don't know if there's anything that very many of us are willing to to die for. I hate racism. Am I willing to die for it? I don't think so. Some of you say yes. I, I'll argue against it and I'll throw in what I can, but to die for something, that's a sacrifice that most of us just aren't willing to make. So any of those people really stand out. But if we're going to use perspective, and to find John Brown as a terrorist or a martyr, let's back up to uh, 2001, when a group of terrorists uh, flew a bunch of planes into the World Trade Center and into the Pentagon and into a field in Pennsylvania. Terrorists or martyrs? Well, they thought they were doing something right. The people they thought they were doing what they were doing. But to everyone else, they were doing So to you and I, they are Bad. Terrorists, no question about it. In their homeland, at least to some people, they would be considered martyrs. It's strange of us to think of, of it that way, that people that are that awful, that are horrible, you didn't witness it, but you've learned from the time you were able to learn that those men that did that are the scum of the earth. Wars were caused because of those incidents because of the mass death of several thousand men, women, and children, almost all civilians. We fought wars and spent billions of dollars because we see them as terrorists, but at home, at least to some of their people, they're heroes. And yet to, to other countries, they see Americans as terrorists. So matters of perspective are super important when we talk about this kind of stuff. Isn't he, Ru is he Russian? What's Borat supposed to be? Okay. I'm moving on, but this isn't, uh, we, we're not doing this, but it's a little bit of a presentation on uh, John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Don't you like that background? Isn't that nice? It's kind of cool. So here we have uh, the, the same image that you've looked at, it, and I'm big into this image. We used to do a recreation. I've got all the stuff to do a recreation, but because of COVID-19, I can't dress you up like John Brown, which is unfortunate. I've got the beard, I've got the fake rifle, I've got the Bible. You can see the, the Omega, the Alpha and the Omega actually on the Bible here, so it's not super clear. So I understand why some of you put a map. A map would make sense too. Some of you just put a book. That's pretty clear. So, some facts about John Brown. Uh, he was born in 1800 to an abolitionist family, but he didn't become an ardent abolitionist until about 1835. So right now at uh, 14 or 15 or 13, however old you are, that a Amy must be 15 because she's driving, so 14 because she's driving, so that's pretty scary. I'm, I've been really practicing not going on the sidewalk because the ratio gets Just teasing Amy, don't stop crying. No tears in history class for crying out loud. Anyway, so... Our opinions and attitudes change as we grow older. There will be things that you're passionate about when you're 35 that you're maybe not too concerned about when you're 14. Uh, there are things that you're passionate about now that when you're 35, you're not going to care about. So life changes, perspective changes. Um, history will tell us that John Brown was some six feet tall and 300 pounds. The image that we saw the artwork that we saw would lead us to believe that might be true because he looked like a giant. Remember, the average size adult man in the Civil War is five foot six inches tall. So, being six foot tall, would that make you a giant? Compared to everyone else. Yeah, comparatively, yes. The average size adult male today in the United States is just under five nine, which means that Mr. Bellamy is average height for an adult male. So, those of you that are bigger than me, 
you're already above average, and those of you that are smaller got a little catching up to do. But remember, average is you take the, all the numbers and you combine them together, you divide by the population, and this, Mr. Bellamy's side, is about right where we're at. So uh, to do a comparison, if we bring in Mr. LeGrand and stand him next to me, that'd sort of be like John Brown versus normal. And Mr. LeGrand is a giant compared to me. If you're six foot tall and weigh 300 pounds, uh, are you a, a huffalo? Oh, what? Are you a big old fatty if you weigh 300 pounds and you're six feet tall? Yeah. Well, I mean, Not necessarily, but if we look at uh, uh, college football players, there's a lot of 300 pound college football players that don't look fat. Is that a true statement? Yes. Yeah, but they're probably 6'3 or 6'4 too, and, and a lot of muscle. John Brown was not 300 pounds. In fact, uh, history books, some of them will say he was six foot tall or six foot three, more likely 5'9". So was he a big man? No. Well, compared to, yeah, compared to normal. Someone that's three inches taller than me seems pretty big, because I'm average. I'm just, nobody ever says Mr. Bellamy's normal, but I'm as close to normal as we get, at least in here. Um, he goes through two marriages. Uh, with <laughs> two, 20 children! I have two, and it's unbelievably difficult. That's about my dad's I don't complain because I love them. Here's the thing. This is part of the story that I think is kind of fun. Uh, well, it's, it's sad fun, but, and it's only fun because it's 200 years after the fact, so when things are 200 years old, we can actually joke about them, even though they might not be funny. His first wife's name was Diantha Lusk. Uh, she died giving birth to his seventh child. So, John Brown was sort of in, uh, oh, shucks mode, because he had seven children, all pretty young, and no mama to take care of them. If that's the case, what do you suppose men did back in the day? Get another wife. You better find another wife. So uh, John Brown marries his poor dead wife's Sister. best friend. Oh, oh. 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 Now we look at that as like that's a super no no. That's you know bro code. You know you don't date your your best friend's ex girlfriend at least for a while because that isn't going to work out very well. But Back then, it was very normal. It's pretty much not even, oh, I love her. I, mean, I, I think she's great. It's more like uh, she doesn't have a husband, and I really need a wife. Boom. It's a deal. Well, they go on. Her name's Mary Ann Day. They go on to have 13 children of their own. Only six survived to adulthood, which was very, very common at the time. Uh, childhood uh, mor <coughs> mortality rates were very, very high. Is John Brown trying to raise a yeah, you wait. I think he's trying to make his own football. So 20 kids. Uh, of them, only 10 survived to adulthood. So one of the questions asks you to describe his background a little bit. And a lot of you said, you know, he grew up with an abolitionist father and he hated slavery. And he saw a black child being beaten. Uh, okay, let's go over some stuff. He wanted to be a minister. Very religious family. Almost everybody put that. That's understandable. Uh, but he ran out of money. So if you want to be a minister or a pastor or a priest, whatever, you typically have to go to college for that. But it's normally not normal college. It's called seminary. So your pastor or your priest, it doesn't matter what kind of church you go to, probably went to seminary to learn the Bible and to learn whatever stuff they need to know for your church. Ran out of money. It'd be like you want to go to college, but there's no way to pay for it, and there's no such thing as student loans. If you can't afford it, you can't go. That's what John Brown goes through. So uh, God spoke to him in 1835 and told him to become an abolitionist, help slaves on the Underground Railroad, but he had to make a living to pay for those children. You can't just be an abolitionist and pay the bills. Uh, so he opened a tannery, which was his father's business. A tannery means you take animal skins and turn them into leather. Uh, it's a horrible, awful, stinky, rotten job. Someone who's a tanner uh, just smelled horrible. And it didn't matter if you bathed, it doesn't come out of your pores. As the chemicals are caustic, they eat the, the skin off of your fingers, it, but it also pays well. Uh, he fails. 
in his tannery business. He tried to raise cattle. He failed at ranching. He wasn't very good at it. He established a post office. Anybody want to guess what happens? He fails. John Brown is sort of like the definition of loser, failure. He doesn't do anything right. So he pours his life into abolition. Uh, so what he decides to do, uh, he, he goes out, he takes a couple of his sons, and this is in Kansas, into a neighboring community, and he killed five pro-slave Kansans. Remember, Kansas is all embroiled in this whole fight over whether to be free or slave. The, with the border ruffians from Missouri, we're calling it bleeding Kansas. John Brown goes, finds five men who he knows support slavery, and executes them, slaughters them mercilessly. Interestingly enough, none of those five men even owned slaves. They were killed for their beliefs. So Brown is a criminal. He's a murderer at that point. He runs away and hides, uh, collects a bunch of weapons, and eventually uh, starts an uprising. He, he gathers uh, 22 men, including three of his own sons. So not only is he willing to potentially sacrifice his own life, but he's also willing to sacrifice his son's lives. That's how much he cares about abolition. Uh, and he attacks uh, Harper's Ferry. Two of his sons died at Harper's Ferry. Now, information gets a little sketch when it comes to this. Uh, the Harper's Ferry uh, was a federal arsenal. Arsenal means it was a storage place for weapons. So like the back cabinet where we where CC's in charge of keeping track of our arsenal in case Fort Calhoun attacks. And those of you that are listening on video, yes, understand, we do not have any guns in here, but this is pretend. Uh, he, he, why does he want to attack an arsenal? Because he wants the weapons. To get the weapons. Here's Brown's plan. You see what you think of this. Attack the arsenal, capture all the weapons, hold the arsenal while news spreads throughout the countryside. As people in the countryside hear that Brown has captured an arsenal full of, uh, of military rifles, he expects that slaves in the area will rise up, overthrow their masters, rush towards the arsenal, he will arm the slaves, and they will begin their own revolution to free the slaves. That didn't happen. It, it kind of makes sense, but word didn't spread as rapidly as he thought, and the government shows up. Uh, the government sends a military leader, a lesser known leader, at least at this point, a guy named Robert E. Lee, who will become a big, big deal later on, to put down the rebellion at the arsenal. So John Brown's got all these guns. He captures it, and he accomplishes his mission, but his phantom army of uh, runaway slaves never shows up. So uh, some history books will tell you that there were as many as five survivors. Some will say there was one. Of the 22 men that John Brown had with them, five of them were black. One that we know of that survived, his last name was Anderson, was a black man. He's the only man that has a written story from Brown's perspective of the Harper's Ferry Raid. The other side's perspective exists because they didn't die. Brown never told his side of the story because as soon as he's captured, he's uh, sentenced to be hanged. In fact, John Brown is the first person in U.S. history to be hanged for committing treason. Treason is going against the, the rules and the laws of your own country. So he's un-American is what they're saying because he did what he did. Uh, this piece of history probably from your history book says five of the 22 escaped. Uh, this morning I Googled it and I'm like, what happened to those five men with no result? So it doesn't mean that the story of those five men doesn't exist, but all I could find was what happened to the one man that escaped, and he writes a memoir of what happens at Harper's Ferry. So when John Brown is getting ready to be hanged, you know, they're like, here's your last supper, and he probably has steak and potatoes or maybe a big pile of spaghetti and meatballs, I don't know, whatever. Think about what your last supper would be. And then uh, they say, do you have any final words? And John Brown says cryptically, which means kind of creepily, he says, I am now quite certain. What does that mean? Let's break this down. Like he's 100% positive. I am positive, 100% sure 
that the crimes of this guilty land, what crimes is he talking about? Slavery. Will never be purged away. What's the word purge mean? The one night of the year when everything. The one night of the year when you can just kill anyone you hear. Is it any crime you want or murder? Any crime. I watched that movie and that's a creepy movie. But yeah. Purge means to do away with something you don't like. So if you have an upset tummy and you vomit, what have you just done? Purged. You got the, the stuff out of your gut that, that isn't making you feel good. Ow. Okay, so we'll never be purged away but with blood. John Brown is telling us that the only way we'll ever get rid of slavery in America is with war. war. He's predicting the Civil War before the Civil War takes place. He knows it's coming. He knows that's the only answer to the problems that are facing America uh, when it comes to this. So, John Brown, uh, hero for the cause of abolition or uh, terrorist, uh, it's a matter of perspective. There is not a wrong answer. I'm glad that they have stuff. You're glad they what? That they did stuff like last year. Well, that's actually a pretty cool quote when you think about it, right? I'm now quite certain, but the crimes of this great land shall never be purged away but with blood. People back then spoke a lot more eloquently than we do. You know, when we talk, we seem to say what we want to say without any fanciness to it. We're much more simple, I guess. So, this is backtracking a little because we just talked about the story at Harper's Ferry. This takes us back to Kansas. John Brown spent most of his time in Kansas. Um, and this is where he kills five pro-slave supporters. This is where he becomes a criminal, by all definitions, because was it illegal in America to be pro-slave? No. Nope. In fact, this is a little controversial, but uh, I want you to think about this just for a minute. Is it illegal in the United States today to be racist? No. What do you mean, no? That's horrible. You're right. It's not. You're right. It's not. For those of you that are listening on the video. So why is it not? Because you have the right to have freedom of speech. Now, is it illegal for me to act out against someone of a different race? Yes. yes. Absolutely, it is. But is it illegal for me to have a thought? No. Is it wrong? Absolutely, it is. But the Constitution of the United States protects the good guys and the idiots. We've talked about that before. So uh, at this point, John Brown goes from being just a guy that has a, a passion for something, abolition, to a criminal. He's killed people because of their opinion. Not okay. Were those five pro-slave supporters guilty of anything? I don't know their story. I don't know if they had acted out. Uh, in favor of slavery in a manner that made them break the law, or if they were just five men who believed slavery was okay. Why is Kansas in What? Yeah, I don't know. That's I've never noticed that. Right here. Big Mike says, why does Kansas have a Z? I don't know. That'd be cool. So, this is stuff we already went over, uh, but this is a picture of John Brown. By the way, never had a beard until the last year of his life. He was clean-shaven, dude. Why do you suppose he has a beard the last year of his life? It's a disguise, right? <laughs> it's kind of like a, none of you have ever actually seen my whole face because I'm wearing a mask all the time. I've never seen most of your faces because, yeah, I know I have, but we wear masks so often that when I see you without a mask, it's like, why wow, you look funny. And you say, think the same thing about me. So uh, some of us are blessed with the fact that we have to wear a mask because it probably covers up most of my ugly. Maybe not. Maybe the bottom half of my face looks better than the top half. I don't know. But, yeah, it's a disguise. Now, this is a great story. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. So, in Congress, we've got some issues with the issue of slavery. Half of Congress is in favor of slavery, and half of Congress is against slavery. So... They have to argue things out. And that's what they do in Congress is they discuss and argue things. It's May of 1856, and there's a guy 
named uh, Charles Sumner, who's a senator from Massachusetts, that's standing in front of the Senate giving a speech against slavery. So Charles Sumner is an abolitionist. Would John Brown have liked Charles Sumner? Yes. yes, they would have been peeps. Well, Charles Sumner may not have liked John Brown because he was a criminal, but they would have at least had the same thoughts. So Sumner's given a speech, uh, and he's uh, denouncing the Missouri Compromise and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act said Kansas and Nebraska territory should decide slavery based on popular sovereignty. Charles Sumner is saying, this is bad, this is wrong, you're all idiots. He's calling people names. In fact, in his speech, he calls out three people in specifically. It's one thing if I say, you're all ding-dongs. It might hurt your feelings a little bit. But if I say, Jade and Hayden and Sierra, you're ding-dongs. Yeah. You're ding dong. Those three people are like, well, it's not fair. Why are you calling me ding dong? So the three people he calls out, uh, Senator Stephen Douglas from Illinois. He's going to become a player in his story later on. He's kind of a big deal. And Stephen Douglas, he's just leaning up against the wall listening to this speech. Now, if you're going to be a politician, you probably have to be okay with people calling you names. Because you're going to have haters out there. So Stephen Douglas, he's kind of shrugging it off like, this guy's a fool. Stephen Douglas, by the way, in Illinois, didn't love slavery, but he believed in popular sovereignty. So he's like, let the people pick. A man named James Mason from Virginia, who was pro-slave. And he also calls out a senator from South Carolina named Andrew Pickens Butler. Here's the thing. If I'm going to say something bad about any of you, what's the first and most important rule about me uh, bad-mouthing somebody? It should be true. And what if you were home sick today and I started saying bad things about you? Is that cool to say bad things about you when you're not here to defend yourself? No. That's not cool. That's kind of, in fact, wouldn't, wouldn't you consider that cowardly? Because you can't even defend yourself. Here's the thing. Butler was suffering from a stroke and he was at home near death. So he's absent. Sumner ridicules him. He's making fun of him. He's not there to defend himself. He says, uh, Butler has taken a mistress. What's a mistress? A lady. A woman that's not your wife. But in this instance, it's not a person. It's that harlot slavery. So Butler loved slavery, uh, and he said the South was immoral, and he mocked the state of South Carolina. Douglas is standing back listening. Like I said, he's kind of leaning up against the wall. You can just picture he's a little guy. He's kind of picturing, and he says, this is a quote, that damn fool will get himself killed by some other damn fool. So in other words, he shouldn't be saying those things right now. He's going to be ticking people off, especially at a time when everyone's a little tense. And he's picking on a guy that's in the hospital or dying, potentially. Because that's like a no-no, too. We don't speak badly about people that just passed away or that are in the hospital sick. And even our enemies, we're like, gosh, I hope they get better. Because once they get better, I can pick on them some more. Well, standing in the back of the room, listening, was a man named Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks was from the House of Representatives from South Carolina. He was Andrew Pickens Butler's nephew. So what do you think he's thinking while this guy's making fun of his uncle? He's getting angry. Brooks thinks about attacking the man. Or he, he thinks that uh, attacking the man that's at home recuperating from a stroke was uh, worthy of a duel. Like pistols, 15 paces. Of... And he thought that he should be beaten with a whip or a cane. So that speech takes place on May 19th. On May 21st, Brooks arrives at the Capitol. Yes. Preston Brooks arrives at the Capitol with a walking stick. Which you picture an old man, you know, uh, it, not old, but you picture a man in the 19th century. 
you don't need a walking stick, but this is sort of like a piece of your outfit. He shows up at the Capitol with a walking stick, and he stands in the back of the room, but Charles Sumner is not there. He's not there that day. So he goes home. The next day he comes back, and he goes to the Senate chamber, and he sees Charles Sumner sitting at his desk. Now, he's minding his own business. He's doing his work. There's other people around. But he notices, Preston Brooks notices that there's ladies in the room. Now, Brooks, though he's going to commit a massive crime here, is not an impolite person. You don't bludgeon someone with a walking stick in the presence of ladies. That's not cool. So here's what happens. Preston Brooks waits until the ladies leave. Brooks is hunched over his desk, or Sumner's hunched over his desk, writing on uh, some, some paper, and, and the desk is kind of like the desks that you guys are in. Um, and, and Sumner walks up, Brooks walks up behind Sumner and starts whacking it. Bam, bam, bam! Whacking him with the cane, beating him senseless, and Charles Sumner tries to stand up. He yells out for help, but bam, bam, bam! Smacking him, across. he's bloody, he puts his arms up to protect himself. He's getting the snot beat out of him, tries to stand up, but if you try to stand straight up underneath the desks that you're in, what happens? You get stuck. He can't get out. He finally falls to the floor. Bam, bam. He's just getting their blood flying all over the place. This is ugly. This is a mess. People finally come running in. They grab Brooks and they throw him off. And Sumner's like, oh, my God. He's bleeding all over. The dude is busted up. He's broken. Um, uh, and, and while he's doing this, he says, you have libeled my state and uh, slandered my relation, who is old and absent. And I feel it my duty to punish you. So Brooks strikes him over the head with his cane. Sumner couldn't get out from under his desk. Brooks continues. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. Beating on him. Uh, Sumner finally breaks away and stumbles while he's continued to be beaten. Uh, Brooks is arrested. Obviously, he just beat a man to near death with a stick. He's taken to jail. Uh, Brooks is let out of jail and sent, he's kicked out of the House of Representatives and sent back home to South Carolina. By the way, he broke his walking stick. Oh, <laughs> he, yeah, you can see my walking stick's a little bit taped together. All right, so he's sent back to South Carolina. Um, when he gets home, the voters of South Carolina uh, sent him hundreds of walking sticks in the mail. <laughs> they loved what he did. In fact, in the very next election, they re-elected Brooks and sent him back to the House of Representatives. <laughs> Charles Sumner is so messed up that it takes him three years to recover. Let's, well, he was once, once, down on the walking stick. Once he recovers. And, and, and if a senator can't do his job, the governor of a state has the authority to replace him. They left his seat in the Senate open to prove a point. After three years, once he recovers, Sumner returns. Now, if you had just been nearly beaten to death and it took three years of your life to get back to somewhat normal, do you think you might quiet down a little bit? No. Yeah. I might. He doesn't. So the <laughs> bam, bam, bam does not slow Sumner down. So we see violence springing up in Congress, uh, and he continues his abolitionist speech. So... Uh, this is an interesting story in history. Brooks was a hero in the South. They, they bought him walking sticks. And as a result of this event and some others, a new political party is created called the Republican. By the way, this would be a little bit different today. It wouldn't be a walking stick. It'd be probably a little bit more like a lightsaber. You know? Yeah. I just chopped off C's head. Yeah. I'll just chopped off. I can just whack off heads. It used to actually work. Oh. For those of you that can't see and that are on the video, I have a Star Wars lightsaber here. Do you need new batteries? Yeah, I need new batteries. Those batteries like you, you got to understand, when I start going to school with lightsabers, this little bell me is like, what are you doing? And I said, there's a perfectly good explanation. <laughs> you gotta understand how difficult it was. First of all, Mrs. Bellamy and I, we're really cheap. We don't spend money on anything. Now, try explaining to her why I'm buying a cane. 
And this was before I was a gimpy person. So uh, she's like, what are you doing with that? You don't need that. And I'm like, yes, I do. If you're teaching eighth graders, if you're teaching eighth graders you need a stick to beat them off with, right? Because there's not too many options oh, to protect myself. Okay. So we lost our... What do you got going on here? Couple TV. Anyway, let's uh, call that good for today. It looks like we're at a good spot to stop because I can't see the screen anyway. Um, double check your grades. Make sure everything is done that needs to be done. And uh, we'll pick up from here next time we have class.